Welcome to Tag Team Talk. I'm Emmett Laverty, and tonight we have as our guest Sheila Raznick. Sheila, welcome to Tag Team Talk. Thank you very much. You are going to be answering questions today from my students uh, in video communications at the American Jewish University, and they are anxious to talk to you. So let's get started. Right. How did we meet? We met at the Virginia Avenue Project, and you actually wrote the piece that we put on at the Getty with the youngsters. The Virginia Avenue Project got a grant for six seniors and six young children. The children were aged between seven and 17 that were part of the project. And we did three performances and actually had a standing ovation on the <laughs> Sunday. And we have some clips from that. Two weeks before my 10th birthday, in 1939, I moved away from my home in London and my large extended Jewish family to live in a small village 150 miles away. 150 miles away. We children stood in the street with our parents opposite, crying profusely. Our parents were crying. We traveled by train and bus until we reached the village. And when we got there, there was a church, a school, a hall, and one shop. One shop. We children were led into the village hall, and the villagers were asked, will you take one? or two, or even three of us. Take the children. As I walked through their garden, they said, mind the stinging nettles. What did they mean? Stinging nettles. I soon felt red sore bumps on my legs. Sore, red. I was a very skinny child and a very finicky eater at home. And of course, we only ate kosher. Pork was not on the menu. Imagine my consternation when I saw half a pig hanging up in the pantry. The food was so different from anything I'd ever eaten. Pork sausages, thick brown gravy, and the vegetables, so many vegetables. <coughs> so different, so many. That Christmas, my friend had a tea party and her foster parents made tinned peaches and cream. The very thought of it still makes me feel so wonderful inside. Just thinking about it. In September 1940, I spent my 11th birthday in an air raid shelter in London during the Blitz. <coughs> As I walked through the garden carrying my birthday cake, sliced bananas on brown bread. A bomb fell next door, and the blast threw me into the shelter. Everyone who lived in the four houses next to ours were killed. My 11th birthday. So, Sheila, that was in 2009. Yeah, that certainly was. Now, the writing of that piece was actually based on what you and the students said yeah. to us. We, we actually recorded it, and then I made a script out of your words. I mean, just, just to clarify that, I didn't, I didn't write it. I mean, I, I, I pieced it together. We had yeah. sat down and talked and written things, and um, yeah, and you wrote a little play about it. <laughs> Well, and I think one of the most beautiful things about that piece was your recollection of your 11th birthday. That is something that has always stayed in my mind. Um, I always say I never remembered my 10th birthday because two weeks before my 10th birthday, I was evacuated from London two days before the war broke out. And that is very vivid, the day I left London. That's very, very vivid in my mind. Now, this was an evacuation to basically protect the children from yeah, they were bombing. They, and well, they were expecting um, bombing. Um, I don't think we as children realized what was going on. Remember, I wasn't even 10 yet. 
And I believe they told us we were going on holiday. <laughs> um, and then we just went off. We went on, on a bus, on a train, on a coach, ended up 150 miles from London. Um, and, and 155 miles were a lot further than, than they are now, I think. Yeah, yeah, it took a long time to get there. And then they just put all the children who came off the coach in the village hall and the villagers came in and said, um, they just said to the villagers, who'll take one child, who'll take two, who'll take three. And because I was on my own, you know, I, I went to one family. And, um, and I think being Jewish too made a lot of difference because the, the people in the village, I think I don't think they'd ever left the village in their lives. They didn't know what Jewish was, and um, you know it was it was a bit difficult. You know they took me to church on Sundays to Sunday school. You were separated from your parents. Yeah, yeah. My parents stayed in London. My brother, who was two years older than me, went away with his school because he was at a different school. My sister, who was seven years older than me, stayed at home with my parents, and she was well conscripted, I suppose, to do war work in a in a factory. And I'd passed my scholarship, so I had to change schools. And I came back to London at the end of term because it was very quiet. There was no bombing and um, so I was actually in London when the Blitz started and on my birthday which was September the 14th I was 11 it was 1940 um, there was no birthday cake because it was rationing and my mother had sliced this banana, which also was precious because she didn't see bananas in the war, on some brown bread and put it on a plate when the air raid warning sounded. And my father went, because he was an air raid warden, he was in the ARP, and um, he went straight to his post. And as we came out into the garden, we had a shelter in the garden, the bomb actually fell behind the wall and we were thrown into the shelter. I was still carrying the plate which was covered in dirt. And we were in the shelter all night. And it wasn't till the morning when we came out that these four houses had been destroyed by the German bombers and all the people killed. And we didn't know till that morning that my father was alive, or, and he didn't know if we were alive or not. It was very traumatic. And you knew the families that lived in those houses? Yes. But, you know, and there was lots of bombing, and then we went into a communal shelter, and that was horrible too. And then in the October, because of the bombing of London, I was sent away again to my grammar school, and I was there for four years. I, I mean, I was in touch with my parents and, and my, my brother who was evacuated to a different place, we, we wrote to each other all the time, we kept in contact. The war ended in 45, but I came back just before the end of the war when um, the doodlebugs came over. The doodlebugs were pilotless planes. Drones. Yeah, they yeah. were drones. <laughs> they just dropped and it was a very traumatic time. Some of the students from my class are here and they have some questions for you. Right. <laughs> so um, we'll do that next. I know this guy who's got a thing for this girl. You're like a dead fish. Mm, I can't help it. But he never did anything about it. We never even kissed. What's the big freaking deal? And now she's getting married. Two, three. He's also got a thing for this other girl. I know you love me. But he totally blew it with her. If that's what it takes. Oh my God. He might still have a thing for this other girl, but the timing is all wrong. So this weekend, he's in Las Vegas. This is Vegas, baby. Take a gamble. Getting abused by pretty girls. You're a real pain in the ass. Do you have any his and hers jewelry? Nope. Getting sage wisdom from the delivery man. Storm the altar, slug the best man, do a Sinatra ballad, then kiss her in front of everybody. She'll eat it up. You would do that? Me? No. But you should. Maybe you know this guy. It seems to me like all your actions are geared toward getting me to give you what you want me to give you, which I don't want to give you, but you want me to want to. Was that English? Better than he knows himself. Ah, do not vomit on me. <laughs> Here 
your imaginary friend is here on the flight. Do you talk often? Can you see him now? What does he look like? She thinks you wasted. Took a room at Lauren. What is the thing that you love the most about yourself? I, th I, th I think the fact that um, I'm able to cope with life at my age, um, especially after my long marriage. I was married to my husband. He, he died after we celebrated our 60th wedding anniversary, and it was very difficult to be on my own. And now it's, it's nearly four years since he died, and I am coping and doing all sorts of interesting things. So I'm very happy about that. <laughs> wow. What figure inspired you to be where you are now? I, I don't think there's any special figure that I can really look up to, but I must say I'm very much a women's liber because of all that I've gone through in my life, because there's, there was never equality with women when I was younger. And I'm so happy now that so many people, and especially young women, are standing up for their rights. When I started my social work and I went to college and trained with the men and we were doing the same job and they were earning more than me, when um, people, um, children didn't have separate passports and when I went to the passport office to get the children on my passport, they said, it can't go on your passport, it has to go on the father's passport and I stood my ground and managed to get passports on both. Lots and lots of things in the world. I mean, you couldn't hold positions in companies if you were a woman because, you know, everything went to men. Um, and I think I was talking the other day about when I was younger, a man would come home from work and sit down and his dinner was ready and he never helped or he never helped with the children. So there's a lot of things going on now. Inspiration I had a friend when I was first married and the kids were young. She, she was 15 years older than me and she said to me, marriage is kid gloves. When my husband grew up, he was one of two boys and his mother spoiled him when he was younger and it was, it was never expected for a man to do things in the house. And I think he, he honestly, when we were married and young, he, he had a lot of learning to do, like we grew up together by being diplomatic, which kid gloves means really, um, and not arguing and being able to discuss things with each other. You know, that helps a lot. How long were you married? My husband died just after our 60th um, wedding anniversary. So it's a long marriage to one person. It is. Yeah. And I even had a card from the Queen. From the Queen? On your 60th wedding anniversary, the Queen actually sends out cards like she does for um, 100th birthday. 100th birthday, she sends out cards. And it says, I'm so pleased to know that you are celebrating your diamond wedding anniversary on the 15th of June, 2010. I send my congratulations and best wishes to you on such a special occasion. Elizabeth R. Oh, to Mr. and Mrs. Dennis Rasnick. And there it is. This is an old Cockney monologue that was performed by Mabel Constant many years ago called The Operation. Core, cool. things is awful down our street. I think I'll have to move and find a more congenital location. I love that street. I was a wow, but things is very different now since Mrs. Jones has had her operation. They took her in an ambulance. Well, I've been on a stretcher once the day I tumbled down the hole the gas man made and got so swole, me verticals was black and blue. They say I strained me what's it too. They say I done an awful lot that things I never knew I'd got, but now I'm treated just like dirt. I might be just a gurm, the lowest kind of maggot in creation. You see, 
I broke my own old bones. The doctors carved up Mrs. Jones the day she had her silly operation. Why? People simply flocked to her the day I fell off Clacton Pier. They brought their aunts in and their cousins, dogs and husbands by the dozens. I let them share me compensation. We had a lovely cold collation with beer and spam the old way round. And you know what spam was by the pan. But now me past has been and gone and so's me bruises and me compensation. They nod so casual. Hello, Ma. You seen Mrs Jones's scar? I'm nobody. I've had no operation. They go and make her cups of tea, a thing they never did for me. Of course, she lets them in free gritties to look at her appendicitis. She keeps it on the mantel shelf. <sighs> oh, I think it's horrible myself. While me, who's done no harm, is left alone. Well, rather than kowtow to her, I'll simply leave this place. I mean, it's a ridiculous situation. I've lived on accidents for years. Her husband had to pay for hers. Hmm. An amateur what's had an operation. I really need some advice. Hell no. I'm afraid of work. We're all afraid of work. That's why we do this. You must get something out of it or you wouldn't do it. We have a situation. I'm at the end of my rope. I could have an attack any second. Can I get a new brother? You can have this one. You were in that movie with Jake Taffeta and the Talking Mouse. They like to fool around with their suits on. Are you involved in a fur triangle? My whole life was flashing before me. It sounds like you're just not truly committed. Lately, I have been doing sensitivity training at the penitentiary. Where does it end? Uh, uh, I will be keeping my eye on you, too. I am a good boyfriend. I'm from Pasadena. Drugs? It's like I was floating for the rest of the day. I'm just gonna be more obnoxious. Why don't you go out and get really drunk or something, you know? Are you gonna throw up? Are you guys reporters? Are you guys brothers? How do you feel about this man choosing golf over you? <laughs> Whoa! Hi, Sheila. So I feel like it's so rare and it's even an honor to meet someone who's had such a happy marriage for over 60 years. What would you say is the secret to making a marriage last that long? Well, first of all, I married my best friend <laughs> and we were always able to speak to each other. A lot of it is compromise, you know, and make sure that you talk about things and try not to argue. And I think as well, my husband's philosophy was that you never go to bed on an argument. If you have a difference of opinion, you make up before you go to sleep at night so you don't carry it over. And also, I think people have to realise that when you speak to somebody else, they might hear it as something else and you, you tend to assume. So many husbands say to their wives, what did I say? What did I do? Um, that's heard very often. and. Um, I think you have to explain exactly, and you can't realise that you know what the other person is thinking. You know, you have to mm -hmm. make things very clear. I think also you have to be tolerant. Um, my husband had a hearing loss, and that was quite difficult at times, because I would perhaps tend to speak to him 
in the other room and he'd say, you know, stop speaking to me in the other room, I can't hear a word you're saying. And, you know, consideration for other people, yeah. Hi, so I wanted to ask you, what brought you to California and Santa Monica specifically? Well, because my daughter married an American. I first came to America in 1975. We were actually here for 9-11. We were on a visit and um, my daughter said to, to my husband and I, have you ever thought about moving out here? And we said no, because we were quite happy flying the Atlantic each time we came. And um, then she said, well, think about it. You're getting older and 6,000 miles is a long way to travel if you're ill, so think about it. So we thought about it and decided that. So we applied and it took two years before the American Embassy gave us an interview. And um, we knew what we were coming to. We knew the weather, what the weather was like, and everything was lovely here. And my husband always said, well, if we don't settle, we could always go back. But we, we settled, and I'm really pleased we moved here. So how did you get interested in acting, and what kind of acting have you been doing recently? I did a little bit of amateur. We used to do old-time musical in England, and I used to do monologues. Um, we were an older group, there were 16 of us, and we had a pianist who was 92, and we used to go to the care homes, to the mental hospitals, and at Christmas we used to go to the, um, put on a show when they made a lunch at the hospital, and we were the entertainment, and then we, we sometimes put on shows for charity. I was also lucky enough to um, when Helen Hunt came to the Broad Theatre and did Our Town. I was an extra in that. I didn't say anything, but I was one of the corpses in Our Town and had to sit on stage mm -hmm. for 30 minutes without moving. But it was such a wonderful six-week experience. Um, and it was just after my husband died. And it just helped me so much because I did not know the story of Our Town. I know it's... A, a story that you all know as Americans. And when I heard that I was going to be sitting in a cemetery, I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? But quite honestly, every single performance, I felt my husband was sitting on my shoulder while I was there. And um, then I did at the Getty with um, when Emmett wrote the story. If something comes along, let, let me say, I, I don't do auditions, but if somebody asks me to do something, then I will do it. A lady enters the foyer of a London hotel and sees a man reading a newspaper. Peter Parsons, as I live and breathe, fancy meeting you. You remember me, of course. I'm Sally Hughes. It must be ten years since we met. You haven't changed my pet. Come, sit down and tell me all your news. Oh, Peter, 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 you couldn't be looking sweeter. Are you keeping fit? Well, obviously you are. How long are you in town? Do you think I'm looking brown? I've just been down to Monte Carlo in the car. Have you ever been to Monte? I just went with Auntie. You remember? Auntie May, wasn't she a yell? She's the one you used to say looked just like my dapple grey. Whatever happened to that horse, dear? <gasps> well, remember our last ride, dear, when you had that lovely idea and I got home with my jodhpur soaked in dew? Wasn't Daddy furious? And yet, you know, it's curious. I've never felt ashamed of it, have you? Well, really, there's no need to. I've just never paid much heed to the conventions or the penalties incurred. So there's no need to feel sorry for that evening in the quarry. Oh, no, my dear, don't say another word. Oh, Peter, 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 my life couldn't be completer. Let's start making plans, dear, right away. Do you want a quiet wedding? I must see about some bedding. Or shall we stay a while with Auntie May? No, straight after the marriage, we must catch the train to Harwich and stay with Mummy for a month or two. Well, you needn't look like that. Mummy's got a lovely flat, and I'm sure she's always most polite to you. Not like your mother and your nasty little brother. You have very little room to sneer and scoff. I won't sit here like a dummy while you insult poor Mummy. If you feel like that, we'd better call it off. Oh, I'm glad you spoke your mind out, and I'm very glad to find out what you're like before the wedding day occurred. 
to think. You very nearly lured me into marriage. Oh, that's cured me. Oh, no, my dear, don't say another word. I suggest we say goodbye. What's this, your card? But why? Mr. Henry Arthur Brown? But that's absurd. You mean you're not, Peter? Well, you might have been discreeter. That's the most ill-mannered thing I ever heard. How could you sit there and never say a word? <laughs> I really need some advice. Have a seat. I've like been diagnosed with this disability and nobody respects it. I'm having trouble getting social security benefits. My girlfriend's all pissed at me and I can't even get a handicapped license plate. Well, that sounds rough. May I ask the nature of this disability? Yes, I'm not ashamed. I have a severe phobic disorder. Really, which one? <clears throat> Ergophobia. Ergophobia. Erg, as in ergonomic? Like ergonomically designed office furniture for ease of use at work? Work! You're afraid of work! <laughs> work! I'm afraid of work. We're all afraid of work. That's why we do this. Not like a phobically challenged person, the thought of going into an office causes me to seize up and go into convulsions. Ugh. In fact, I could have an attack any second. Are you gonna throw up? You're not being very sensitive. So, like, are there any symptoms? Are there clinics and such? You guys are just like everyone else. The sign says free advice. It doesn't say you're gonna like it. I have yet to hear any advice. Get a job? You do what you can.